you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, colleagues, for joining us, and welcome to our extended lunch talk series. They normally take an hour, but this time around is going to take an hour, 30 minutes. Um, it's a special one um, because El Joseph here yeah, is going to take us through the whole process of writing an op ed. I think um, as researchers, um, we are obviously interested in, um, you know, making our the findings of our results known to a wider community. Um, so to be able to refine that process, who then do we approach um, with this kind of information? Uh, what platforms should we be looking at? Uh, more importantly, it's the phrasing um, of the message in the op-eds. Um, because in most cases, I think we need to simplify it. It's no longer an academic platform, but it's just writing for ordinary people. So it's going to help us with that process. So our presentation today is going to be broken into three parts. Um, initially, we're going to start with my colleague, um, Dr. Hafter, who's going to take us through some of the projects that uh, Tyresha is working on for the year. And I think this is going to be very important because people that are contributing to those projects, we're also going to be reaching out to you as individuals to then help us with some of your op-eds for those particular projects um, that are coming up for the year. Um, this is not just a one sort event that we're doing. It's a continuous process that we're going to be involved in as we see a lot of countries going through elections, as we report about different things in you know, uh, various uh, chosen fields. Uh, um, so I'll start with my colleague, Dr. Hafton, who's our research manager at uh, Tyresha, who's going to take us through the process, after which we're going to ask him questions or people need to ask questions if they have, and then we'll get into the main event for the day, which is the help ends, um, and then uh, after which, um, after Hafton has spoken, I will then um, introduce Al. Okay, Dan, thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you, Henry, uh, too busy. Um, yeah, I'll try to give you an update on what's happening. Uh, things are moving fast, so I'm not necessarily fully updated, but I'll update on the parts that I'm aware of. There might be things happening on the side, so, so, uh, uh, in just like the foundation I have. Um, so we've spent quite some time in the first couple of months this year to start a, an actual sort of planning process, so, I think now the research group has officially been up and running for what is it about a year, nine months or so. Uh, we've been working a little bit longer, but until now we've kind of like uh, moved a little bit on an ad hoc basis. And I think we're now at a point where we want to start thinking more long term uh, about what we actually do, what we do, and importantly also what we don't do. Because right now we're doing all these all kinds of super interesting projects, but it also means we tend to be a little bit scattered. Uh, so we had a couple of, of planning sessions and we are now working on what will probably be like a, a multi-year sort of strategic planning uh, document where we outline some priorities and objectives for the next sort of three to five year period. The idea is to have a rolling document so that once a year we will update, but that at any given point in time we have a pretty good idea of where we are moving and, and what our, our priorities are. Um, so it's still an internal process, but at some point uh, we are going to open up a little bit more and see some inputs from, from, from some outside partners or associates, but also different entities that we collaborate with. So you'll hear more about that. On the research, a lot of our work, uh, in fact, all of this year will be focusing on these various book projects we have in the pipeline. Uh, so there's a reader on digital transformation uh, that we are editing. There's a volume on, on digital technology and in political institutions. So that's a lot of work really that's being invested into these, uh, into these book projects. Uh, um, we had initially targeted a publication date of October, coinciding with, with ISHOP. Not sure it's going to be possible, but, but we're still working with that kind of like floating uh, deadline now. Um, so that's on the various book projects. Uh, in addition, I think I've mentioned it before, we have a small project on Chinese digital platforms. So that's a partnership with uh, 
the Digital China Institute, which is an entity in the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. It's funded by the China Africa Institute, which is a Chinese government entity. Um, so that's moving forward. The first activity under this project will be our visit to China uh, between the 6th and the 17th of May. Uh, which will really be like the kickoff of the project. And then the Chinese counterparts are coming this side in October. We're hoping that it to, to Thailand so that they can be part of ISCOP. Uh, and then we'll continue working with them for probably about two, two weeks in, in October. So that's on the on this new project on Chinese digital platforms. Um, in addition to that, I mean, high level stuff so we have like ongoing conversation about various other uh, research projects there's focusing on social media uh there's something about youth and social media political polarization kind of like the linkages between youth social media and online or political polarization uh recently also started conversations with the Hans Seiden foundation about a new project focusing on, on deep fakes so the use of ai in the context of elections, uh, which I mean, it's been quite a topic in the last uh, three, six months. There's been several recent cases in India. A few days ago, you may see it in the US. There was a picture going around with uh, Donald Trump and African American voters, and it was all fake. So that's something coming up. Uh, but yeah, I'll keep you updated on that. Under the education, I think we call it training and education. That um, so we're still working on uh, the MOOC on digital transformation. So that's the massive open online course that we're we're developing. Uh, we completed the first recordings uh, in this last week, and the remaining recordings I think will be done later this month. Uh, we didn't probably have more information on it. So uh, that's moving ahead and. Um, I think the plan is still to maybe not. We won't reach the Q1 deadline that we initially looked for, but but it's not long thereafter. So that's uh, that's another big priority in the coming months. Um, then I believe the second iteration of the civic tech innovation course is also coming up. I know the dates have shifted around, and I don't have the latest dates. I don't know if you, if you remember off the top of your head. No. No. Okay. But that's so. So that's the course ran the first time last year. Was it June? No, I don't remember. About a year ago, we ran it the first time, uh, and it will be running for the second time then uh, sometime in the coming in the coming months. Um, more information to follow. In terms of, yeah, I don't even want to call it outreach. Uh, I mean, of course, the big we heard a lot about it already. I'm gonna. Repeatedly given. As you know, we're co hosting ISCOP uh, on the 1st to 2nd, 1st to 4th October. Uh, and I think now there are some delays, but I believe now the conference website is up and running and has the information. I don't think the registration is still working. I checked this morning, but the registration function is still not working. I'm sure it'll be sorted out in the, in the, in the coming days. Uh, the call for papers have been has been published. Um, so you can check that out. I mean, it's available on the on the on the website, and I think the deadline, submission deadline for papers is 21st of April. So if it's something you're interested in, uh, go have a look. Um, Maybe just to highlight that the call so for some conferences, you only require to submit an abstract, but in this case, the expectation is that you submit a full paper. So on the 21st, if you're interested, on the 21st of April, they will want to see full papers. And then those papers will go through a review process, which means that by the time uh, you present at the conference, uh, it will be a peer reviewed paper. And, and, and for those of you that are following it's important academic credentials, um, you will get full, full credit scores because it's peer reviewed. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, I think those were the things that, that's what I've noted down here. I don't know, Zico, if you have anything to add, anything you're missing? Uh, no, I think that's just about it. Um, yeah. The next last book series every first Thursday of the month. We'll share that invite out. We already have a speaker for that. Okay. 
So just confirm about the talking. So multiple. Good. So, all right, thanks, uh, Hafton colleagues. Um, any questions regarding the projects that Tanisha is uh, working on currently? Um, if you have a question online, you can just simply raise your hand. We can, yeah, that's true. You can also send the an email and we can um, respond to that, um, you know, after all of that has happened. And I just want to emphasize again, particularly colleagues taking part in ISTA, the public project that we involved in, that we really are looking for um, in terms of your up-end. I think Emma's uh, sort of lay out the details in terms of the length of a particular um, of X that somebody is interested in writing. Um, I know that the bar now is elections um, around the continent up, up until December at least. But I mean, there's other things that are happening in between. So it's not just restricted to elections. Uh, we're going to be looking for a variety of things. And um, he's going to talk about the various platforms um, that we are planning to uh, publish um, these um, op-eds that we're asking uh, people to submit. Um, in the absence of uh, further questions, I think the next item will be um, L um, taking us through the relationship between a uh, digital applicant and Tyresha. Um, as a research, um, hoping to, uh, you know, finally become <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the background. On the background. Okay, sorry about that for me. We just lost you for a moment. Um, I was just emphasizing that uh, in terms of the project that we have for the year, we are going to be looking for submissions um from you know in terms of the different research areas that uh, people are writing about. Um we don't have to wait for these particular conferences to actually start. I think now is the time to actually you know, start putting up work in terms of what you're working on uh, by giving us your opinion in your particular um, area of um, specialization. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce El Joseph, who's going to tell us about the relationship between digital applicant and Tyresha. And ultimately, he's going to then take us through this whole process of uh, how you go about um, writing an op -ed. I know that some of you attended um, the recent um, webinar that we had. I think, Kamantha, you did with the, the conversation. Yeah. And I think there were interesting things that came out in terms of similarities and differences between op eds and what, for instance, the conversation is looking for. So I'm hoping it's going to touch on some of these issues so that people are clear um, in terms of what is required of them. So to just introduce him briefly, El Joseph is the founder and editor of the Digital African, which is an independent journalism organization. He's an award-winning journalist, editor, and publisher with over 25 years of experience in editorial and publishing. Joseph began his career as a business and marketing journalist at Marketing Mix magazine before moving into general, general lifestyle magazines, and these include Tribute and Indigo. He co-founded Business Century Publishing, which launched Maverick magazine which is now known as Daily Maverick, at Mojo Publishing, which uh, licensed YF, uh, YMAG, Slim to YF and yes. yeah. and Campus Times from the Mail and Guardian. Joseph then ventured into mobile software as a resident entrepreneur at software development company, uh, Ferris Avantgarde, so what is called? Yeah. As it's called, yeah. before founding his own tech uh, startups. So I think we can you can tell from his introduction that he's been a man. He's actually a man that has been around, um, and um, he's somebody that knows this subject area too well. 
So I'm going to invite him to just take us through this whole relationship that Africa Digital has with uh, Tyrone Shires of the Sex Program. Thanks, Maxwell. Um, yeah, okay, that was a rather pleasant introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, generally I don't wear shirts and shoes and I was told, not told, I just assumed that I had to wear a shirt and walked in and found puppies and t-shirts, but okay. Um, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, this, I think, is what's really, really important here is, one, why we exist. Two, the fact that Tyresha is, in fact, a founding partner of the Digital Africa. We've only really been around for what, a matter of, well, since October last year. Um, and Tyresha is actually working um, with us through this process, and it's, it's been really, really interesting. And I have to say thanks to Maxwell and Prof Geshe for, for working with us. And most recently, obviously, um, Haftan, who came over to us once, and we had a really, really long and interesting conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think just to kick off, we are constituted under the Adamela Trust, which was a which is a trust that was born out of the Mail and Guardian. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, organizations like Amabungani, Bekesisa. Um, these all came out of the Adamela Trust, and we are being incubated underneath them as well. Um, we very specifically looked at um, driving digital transformation on the continent. That was the thing that came about, and if I bring up this, it's a very busy sort of infographic, but essentially the one that we are, the issue that really drove this, um, sorry, how do I, um, okay, if you, can, if you can have a look at the little cartoon on the right, it essentially captures one of the primary reasons we, we exist. And it's the idea that you have investors who find the continent particularly opaque within the digital space. We have African leaders on the governance side who struggle to adapt to digital transformation. And then you have the population who are just really not benefiting from these difficult relationships between the two. And we came up as a journalism organization that is specifically targeting these issues. And of course, there was an immediate synergy between Tyresha and us, because when I met with Prof Geshe, we, we realized that there was a, you know, what the research that was going to be coming out of Tyresha and the way in which we were constituting our, our organization, there was definitely um, uh, um, an interesting synergy there. And just to give you a very, very quick understanding, I mean, if you consider that Africa attracts less than 1% of global startup funding, digital funding, less than 1%. And that is insane when you consider that a lot of people looking to digital transformation as a, from an economic development point of view for the continent. And if you consider, <coughs> excuse me, how how bad the continent's response has been, we had to look at where those, where those blockages exist and how to put that out into the world in ways that could help transform the decision makers, the policy makers, the investors, all of those kinds of people who make a difference. And not only that, but also the citizenry. Um, one of the biggest ones, and obviously, like we say, intersectionality is always an issue when we look at things and, I looked at particularly a very interesting stat that came up that I thought was absolutely astonishing, which is that for every dollar invested in Africa um, in, in the digital landscape, only two cents went to female founders. And that is an incredibly difficult thing to, to consider. So that just gives you a sense of, of, of where, we, where we place ourselves. Having discussed this with, with Prof Geshe and, 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 and Maxwell, um, there were a bunch of themes that kind of came out of all of these discussions. And you can see them on the right there, digital governance and public policy, social and civic technology, the digital divide, obviously a big issue on the continent. 
um, the digital innovation ecosystem, which will include the investment, play, you know, investment plays, accelerators, incubators, AI in Africa. Halfdan made mention of things like deep fakes, um, especially if we go as we're going into election season. Digital politics again, another really important aspect going into election series. How politicians respond um, to digital on the continent, um, and then digital citizenship, labor, and productivity. Citizenship, essentially, we can talk about things like privacy. I mean, it was such an interesting, just this morning, uh, an issue came up on a, on a WhatsApp group in our area, which was essentially a garage sale. And is completely ungoverned. It is run by nobody in particular. And we looked at the idea around Poppy and understanding that suddenly all of our phone numbers are available. We put out our names. There's no, no way to police this. Nobody's in charge. Um, so our digital citizenship is under extreme pressure um, from a security point of view. These are all the kinds of things, labor and productivity. Labor, for instance, the idea of digital sweatshops existing. I was a, a, a victim I personally uh, in terms of dealing with an international company that bought my services um, and then just basically said, OK, we don't really need you anymore. And there was no recourse, absolutely none, because it was a, it was a global uh, engagement. So these are some of the issues that we are going to be targeting. And how are we going to do that? Op-eds. Now, you'll see that's right at the top of that sentence. Um, and that also came out in terms of the way we understood how the conversation operated and the, idea, the relationship between research and the ability for us to then take that research and take it into the real world. Um, op-eds, columns, we will be conducting investigations, we will analyze trends um, as we grow the team, we will report on corruption, incompetence. Um, we are about to launch a couple of podcast series, of course, um, Maxwell will be our, one of our first guests and um, we, we're actually riding on, on the election series, which I'll talk about in a second. And of course, we will then host a few webinars and, and run a weekly, weekly newsletter. Um, just to give you a sense of how we came to be, um, the Adamella Trust I've mentioned, Tyresha was a founding partner, um, and then we have uh, two publishing partners, which is the Mailing Garden and the Daily Maverick. I don't really think I need to introduce those. Um, those are two very well-known independent publishers in South Africa. The idea is that we're going to expand that throughout the continent and look for other publishing partners as we, as we go along. Um, in just a little timeline, we started, I started conceptualizing this um, around July last year. Discussions were with Geshi and um, eventually Maxwell came on board. We got together a whole bunch of people who represent themselves on our editorial board. You'll see the Research Institute for Innovation and Sustainability, obviously Tyresha. We derive, we derive quite a lot of our reporting from Africa, the big deal, which covers um, uh, the amount of money that is flowing, investments over $100,000 into startups on the continent. And obviously AWS startups who actually provide a lot of the technology um, um, underpinning a lot of the digital startups in, on the continent. Um, we do have now, we've obviously, worked with now the Civic Tech Innovation Network by our relationship here. Um, we launched a pilot with three stories published in the Mail and Guardian in sort of late last year. Um, our website went live and we began prototyping a content marketplace. And then we also then secured Daily Maverick as a permanent publishing partner towards the end of last year. And we published those three articles. Um, and then we put in the, in the Mail and Guardian towards the end of last year. And in the beginning of this year, we published our first story in the Daily Maverick. Um, and yeah, that, that's basically us in a nutshell. And in terms of the relationship now, we're about to launch an election series um, with a series of op-eds um, that form part of our pilot program, which will all go live on in the Mail and Guardian. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, there's five 
at the moment, Maxwell. Um, so we've got four out of the five, and I held back on the publication because I thought this would have been actually a perfect opportunity to explain. I didn't want to um, bring up any individual authors, <laughs> but I thought it would be great because it was a great first pass at providing op-eds. And um, then I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to really just explain from our side, we are an independent media organization and we have publishing partners and they themselves have their own ideas of how things should be. Um, and as you mentioned, you've had the conversation come and talk about how they want to receive things. And our conversations with um, and, and discussions with the Mail and Guardian and the Daily Maverick, as you can well imagine, they're two very different publications. A lot of people would sort of lump them in, in the same place, but they're actually not. Um, the Daily Maverick is sort of very fast paced, you know, defend aggressive reporting, not a lot of reportage in that sense, but they, they, they're always at the cutting edge and they, they're, they're trying to, try to defend things. Um, the Mailing Guardian looks, tries to play position itself primarily as a thought leader. Um, they don't really look to going at the, the broad spectrum of, of, of readers and and listeners that say the daily maverick would position itself as and from that perspective you can see that something that would be published in the daily maverick wouldn't necessarily follow the same tone and voice um and i think that's a nice way to segue are there any questions in terms of who we are and the relationship with tyresha at this point and then i can move into how to do a, how to write an op-ed <laughs> I think Zulu, if you can just check with the colleagues online. Any questions, colleagues, um, regarding what uh, Alice said um, in terms of the relationship between Digital Africa and uh, Tyresha? I think also what we're trying to do with the election series, where we also um, just knowing that a lot of countries are involved in elections until December, we are trying to paint a, a picture um, of different scenarios of what's happening on the continent. Um, I thought maybe, I don't know. Yes, if okay, I can, I can give you a little bit more on, on the election series. So a lot has happened since we last spoke. Um, we've looked at the election series, not only in isolation or in relation to Tyresha. It was a great starting point um, for us to to kick off with the with the five op-eds and for us to get it um, going. So we're in the process now where we've actually engaged other, other partners. So we've got IMSA coming in, which is the Institute for Election Management um, in South Africa, um, as a partner who are going to work with us. We're starting a podcast series where we're going to get a host, um, Sinatema is actually with us right now, <laughs> uh, where we will take a far more conversational and in, it's not going to be a, a, a what do you call it, uh, a, um, a spoken version of the stories that are being published or the op-eds. And, and this is where the conversational tone, the idea is of having a host who is the protagonist, who's going to represent the, the, the viewers, We'll have the neutral expert who will generally be the author from one of the op-eds. And then we'll have, we'll try and bring in what I'm calling the antagonist, but essentially a practitioner who is affected by whatever that the, that researcher has, has, has brought out uh, in terms of what the op-ed is saying. So that we can create a little conversation and a discussion. It's not a debate. It's not an interview. It's about three people who are affected by the evidence that has just come out. And the idea is, can we, can we at least create the, an idea of what all of this actually means in whatever it is? So if we're talking about misinformation, disinformation on the continent um, around elections, are we talking very specifically about deep fakes, for instance? And we, we'll allow the conversation to kind of meander. Um, and that's essentially what we really like about the podcast um, channel uh, and medium versus say an opinion piece which is going to be very pointed and directed and will be targeted at a very specific audience within a very specific channel and then this is also a nice way for me to to introduce some of the guys around the table is our our 
uh, gosh, I hate calling it a youth desk because it sounds incredibly patronizing and condescending. The guys here, that's Cavello, Dikeledi, and Sinetemba, they're going to be taking a lot of this content and making it accessible to younger people. And they actually came up with a brand called Frame of Reference, um, and it's actually incredibly brand new, um, which is then going to be the brand that's going to take it out. It's going to be a digital African um, podcast. They have made myself and my colleague Stanley over there do a lot of TikToks over the last uh, month. And um, that has been quite a, an education for some, <laughs> for some of us. Um, but it's wonderful because now what we've done is we've got a very, very meaty subject that we can actually hang this on. Um, and just to give you a sense, uh, the first one of the first election uh, TikToks that we put out was just about how to register online. And that went absolutely ballistic. Um, people, a lot of young people were like, well, we actually didn't know we could. How do we do it? It's not working. And they thought we were representing the IEC. And in fact, we had to be very clear and say, actually, sorry, we're not, we just put it out there because we were just investigating on our own. And, uh, you know, um, we were talking about, for instance, we're going to go move into the misinformation, disinformation, which is going to be one of the, the first op-eds, which is uh, um, Tom Boyer's piece um, on how disinformation and misinformation is going to be critical in the way in which um, the, the, the electorate is going to engage with the elections. Obviously, we're very South Africa focused at the moment, but a lot of the stuff is going to go um, our website is, is the Digital African. It is not a South African website. It is very much focused on, on the continent. And uh, we will then make the, the, all of these op-eds available globally. Um, and yeah, so, so, so the election series is looking incredibly exciting. Uh, it was initially conceptualized out of the, the, the op-eds that were going to be coming from Tyresha, and then it just kind of exploded. Um, into this multi-format, um, multi-audience um, uh, series that's going to basically run for the entire year because there are like 17 sub-Saharan um, um, elections happening this year, 20 on the continent, include North Africa. So, yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun and a very interesting, and that's why it was really important for us to then go, okay, let's see how these op-eds can get get us into the, the upper end and then feed into the podcasts. Um, one of the other podcasts frame of reference will be the three young women here literally just commentating on the op-eds that are coming through. So it, it, some of them will form part of the election series, obviously others will form. Um, in fact, the first one that they just recorded last week um, was very much on elections and how it's affecting uh, younger people in, 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 in South Africa. And just, it, it was an amazing uh, experiment almost to just see where those conversations were gonna go and how they, and Sinatema did a fantastic job in hosting that along with Kabela and Dikeledi. So yeah, like I said, that's kind of exploded into a much bigger program than we had uh, anticipated. And especially with now that we've brought in frame of reference as, as a new brand for younger people. Um, any questions on the election series? Come on. Hey, just, oh, you've got some, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I want to find out, hmm. this, is a, this is a massive election year for many African countries. Yes. And you said uh, Digital Africa is obviously not just South African. So I want to find out, are any of those op-eds or content you are creating going to look at maybe some of the countries, any implications for South Africa with their elections. Then I wanted to find out about, um, I mean, I get a sense that the target audience is youth, which is absolutely phenomenal and necessary. I want to understand if there's anything to be done about gender. One of the things I'm trying to do is work with our academics, with media, to really look at the manifestos and see how much of it actually talks about 
um, gender issues, especially given our country's uh, issues around gender-based violence, etc. And I find that these manifesto launch, you know, it's like all of these big promises, etc. I'm really interested in this one, if anybody covers anything about gender. So I just wanted to say Okay. I'm really looking forward to seeing the TikTok videos and the, um, <laughs> yeah. the, the reason I'm, I'm impressed about it, you, I, mean, I shared this video with Temba where they were having this conversation and they were talking about how Cape Town is going to become a republic if the DA wins. And I, and I showed Temba and I said to him, the amount of civic education that needs to be done in our country is actually quite scary if people are sitting and thinking that Cape Town can become a republic given our constitution. So I'm really, really would love to engage with you and see the work that's been done in the group. And I think there's like potential for us to do a lot of stuff there. Okay, I'm not going to respond to the, the gender one just yet. We've, yeah. we've got very capable women over here who can respond to that. Um, just just in terms of the, the, um, the civic education of the TikToks, um, one of the things that, I mean, as we said, one of the comments that came through was, if you don't vote, your vote is going to be ANC, for instance. Yeah. That seems to be quite a, a common trope right now, right? And we, I was quite taken aback by that. We were all kind of like, oh gosh, how do we actually respond to this? We're not election, uh, um, what do you call it, specialists. And... Um, so that's when I kind of, that's, that was in fact the spark that went, oh crap, we've actually got to go and find a lot more people around this who can, who can bolster our responses and make them um, more solid, more well-informed and, and that sort of thing. So being able to, to, to respond to it and then to respond to it in a way that is understandable. And that is another um, issue. And I think from a gender perspective, do you guys want to... Want to hop on that? But before they do that, yes. Um, I think I just for the benefit of people online as well, as we are asking people to contribute. Yes. Are we looking for articles with a digitalization aspect, or is it just yes. general stuff? No, no. It's obviously because we are the digital African, and because we are sort of um, framed within digitalization, it is very much around the digital. And um, I mean just in a, from a gender perspective. Um, if you look at rural, for instance, right? They are, the statistics show that women are less likely in rural areas in Africa to engage with the internet. They have access, they have coverage, but they're just not using it. So that is part of the, the, the digital divide that we're talking about. Now, if you try to extrapolate that from a digital perspective, into elections, how are women engaging with the elections, particularly outside of the urban areas and, and uh, um, sort of the digitally dense areas? So yes, there's plenty to be said, but yes, from our perspective, in terms of how we are looking at it, it is very much around the, the digital touch point. Um, it's not a sort of generalized um, uh, conversation. You guys want to respond quickly? Yes. That uh, comparison of how, like you said, the rural women are less likely to participate in terms of and then you look at the economy of the elections. Are you looking at it in terms of participation, in terms of elections, or is it voting issue? The reason I'm asking this is because um, people are. Okay, I think you can answer it. <laughs> it's going to it's going to cover all of these issues. In fact, when when we met with Maxwell, it was around things like voter access, voter information, electoral processes. It's going to cover numerous issues. Like for instance, and a lot is driven by the fact the op-eds that are coming through. You know, ICT skills, um, misinformation, disinformation. Um, what was the other one was, are, are politicians actually driving the misinformation? What are their roles? Do they, are they, you know, involved? So, that, you know, there are numerous, uh, Maxwell's piece in particular was looking at it from an electoral process point of view, you know, digitalization um, and how it influences uh, elections on the continent. So, yes, it covers the full, full spectrum. 
because it's a, a long, this is not just a once off. This series is going to be running for the entire um, for the entire year, um, covering all as many of the, the elections as we possibly can, given our resources, obviously. But uh, we would like to be able to cover as many within the context of just reporting, analyses, op-eds. Um, we want to bring in a couple of columnists. And then we've got we've we've got an a, a, a target of four in-depth investigations for this year and um, that we want to go you know but those are kind of like two to three month investigations with a very long piece um that we've negotiated obviously with data maverick and 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 mail and guardian to carry so it's going to be a yeah a full spectrum thank you um, right. No, that's true. Yes. We miss information online. But on the other end, it doesn't necessarily mean we ignore that there could be a potential audience there. You know. I think it's a good. Indeed, indeed. Um. Okay. I think we just for the sake of time, do you want to just have a quick response on the gender issue and then? Because okay. I'd, I'd like to, to sort of segue into the op-ed situation because that is in fact the the the, the kernel that or the seed that was grown into this. <laughs> um, so yeah, so so if we can just, all right, there we go. All right, I'm, I must make apologies for Prof. Colette Gordon, who is a linguistics professor here at WITS, um, in the, an, an English professor and literature professor, who helped me initially with the way in which we were engaging with the academic uh, um, content and how to, to work with the content initially to try and convert those into stories. Um, but let me just take you very quickly to what my discussions with, with um, Prof. Gordon, as well as with the editors at um, uh, Daily Maverick and, and Mail and Guardian, as to the things that will make a successful op-ed. Now, let's let me just take you through. We've just got three points, really. What what are the elements that make up a good op-ed? How to organize your piece? That's a little bit of uh, practical advice. And then this one is primarily aimed at uh, Maxwell. Uh, <laughs> But I think a lot of you who might be in the position where you're going to be discussing with your colleagues and being able to to solicit in um, op-eds from from your colleagues, this is a really nice way to be able to say this is how we want you to 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 submit these. Um, there is a different document that includes things like a tabulated version of what you can send out and what people need to be able to to write in it. Um, this is just the presentation of that document, which I can obviously share with you uh, post this. I've already shared it with you, Maxwell, um, but if you want me to do that as well, I can, I can send it out. So what makes a good op-ed? Now, what's interesting is a lot of people don't really know this. Op-eds were in fact just pieces that sat next to the editorial page in a newspaper. For those of us who are old enough to know what a newspaper looks like, um, as you opened it up, there would be the editorial page where the editor would talk a bit about what's coming in. And then on the right hand side, you would have the uh, pieces that were written by individuals. That is obviously with, with us becoming more digitalized, that's turned into opinion pieces. A lot of people then just assumed that OP meant opinion. In fact, it meant opposite. Um, and right now, most people just kind of understand that. But I think what's really important here is when you say strong, informed, and focused. These are really important aspects of an op-ed. Um, people assume that when you do an, a, a thought leadership piece or people conflate a lot of these and what an op-ed is, is I am an expert, I get to say what I want to say, and that's pretty much it, right? And what why a lot of op-eds don't actually make it onto onto these platforms is largely because that's what they are um they tend to be soapbox soapboxing people getting standing up and 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 blaring on their on their foghorns about what they what what annoys them at that particular time 
But if we look at it, the key characteristics, you're looking at about 700 to 800 words, you must have a clearly defined issue or event. It is not good enough to just go to your research paper and write an essay. It really is important, guys. It's not an opportunity to write an essay derived from your paper. You've got to be very clear on what the issue or the event is. You've got to have a clearly defined point of view. Uh, these kinds of pieces, people come to them because they want to know what you think. That's the opinion part of it. What is your view on this? That's the event. What is your view? Come across with a voice that's, that will differentiate you from what everybody else is saying. Otherwise, what's the point of you having, what's the point of having a, an opinion on this? Um, tone is really important. Try and be conversational, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. And here's the critical one. Balance the data with anecdote, guys. It is so important. I learned a new term from our younger colleagues on the right-hand side, which is called relatable. <laughs> Relatability is something I, I was never really uh, interested in, but the idea of anecdote creating a path to relatability for people to understand what your position is and how it relates directly back to the data. And I, I've got a little set of questions here, which is really nice. When you've written your piece or before you write your piece, what is my point? Does it relate directly to the issue or the, or the event? Who am I writing this for? Can I back up my assertions? And lastly, what do I want my readers to do with this? Think of yourself when you're having a conversation. Now I'm just presenting you with information. What do I want and my opinion on this? Do I want to convince you of my point of view? Do I just want you to realize something? These are all important questions. Now, I'll take you through. These are the elements, the topic. Now, most of you are going to be experts in your field of study, and often that's going to define what your topic and your theme is. But understand the difference between the topic and the theme. The topic is very much related to that person, the place, the issue, the incident, or the thing that is going to bring people into the piece. Really important. The theme, as I've said here, is going to be implied by where it's being published. So the difference between a Daily Maverick or a Mail and Guardian. Um, ask yourself, why is my point important? And that will help to define your theme. Um, spend time on this, guys, before you start writing. It is not, you know, don't just sit there and just kind of have a little word salad and then hope that something will will come out of that. Be deliberate. I don't have to tell you, you guys are academics, you're deliberate in everything you do. Okay, the next part, <laughs> um, Stanley said I was being a little bit um, discourteous but <laughs> in saying this, but I think it's, it's, it's important. Yes, we all assume that our opinion counts, but while you may be a celebrity in your, in your world, uh, not everybody knows who you are. So, You've got to underpin what you're what you're asserting with it with research, and I don't need to say much more about that. You guys are researchers at heart, so you know the types of research you can access will mostly will be your own research. But I would expect that you would be able to look for for more than just your paper, um, and I'll explain how that will come through in a minute. This is something that a lot of people struggle with because you're not natural journalists or, or kind of fiction writers, et cetera. Voice is really important. The tone that you take too casual and you, lose, you risk losing credibility, too formal and it becomes boring to read, okay? So this picture really shows you that you're having a conversation and with a colleague, right? And that colleague is the reader of that particular publication. Um, and that's one of the reasons we have frame of reference, for instance, because I really can't expect the, the, the younger readers to be able to engage in the way that you're writing. Um, I actually discovered all kinds of interesting things about the way, way younger people consume this information, how the commentary is almost as good as the actual uh, op-ed itself. Um, but understand who you're writing for, 
you can take direction from the publications you're going to be writing for. They will give you a sense of who your readers are and then picture that person as who you're having this conversation with. Let's go into the structure. This is very interesting. I mean, very simple. I'm not going to take too much time on this, but um, your introduction or lead, I know it looks like a, like a spelling error, but it's not. It's in fact an old journalisting term. Um, short and simple, 50 words, guys. Limit the details. I know you have, you want all of the stuff to spill out <laughs> because it's all sitting there, but just limit the details, get to the point what it is, use those, those direct, directions I gave you earlier on um, the, the, the incident, the theme, the topic, get to it. Avoid cliches, bad puns, and using um, and trying to punctuate just to, uh, you know, with lots of exclamation marks. That doesn't work. <laughs> um, and then read it out loud to yourself. Put yourself in the reader's position and say, if I had read these 50, if somebody spoke these 50 words to me, would it make sense? Would I be interested? The next point is called, is the, are the arguments, right? And this is just a very, very basic way in which to present your arguments. Make your statement, provide some evidence and, and a clear anecdote. And this is where I was saying, look for counter arguments. And in our case, where we're talking about academics, the counter arguments are going to be in other papers that maybe contradict what you're saying or that uh, posit a different opinion on, on what you're talking about. It is important, guys, in your op-eds. You may not necessarily have brought too much of that into your own papers or whatever the case may be, but use some of those references that you've got, some of those citations you've got in your papers to try and present a, a counter argument. There's a little space here. Please avoid confirmation bias. I know it is easy. Um, accurate representation is really accurate representation of the counter arguments, not just your own. Try and make sure that you, you really represent the opposition to this. That creates tension in your piece and people want to continue reading because they want to see why your opinion is, is, is so much more well-informed well-constructed relative to the counter-arguments. So keep your argument clean at first and then introduce your counter-arguments. When you eventually get to your, your, your conclusion, you would have made maybe two or three points. Remember, you're still working within the 700 to 800 word constraint. Open and closed, an open conclusion would be something like a suggestion. A closed, co closed conclusion is where you are very clear on what it is you want people to do. Be deliberate. Do not be wishy-washy. Do not try to be, this is an opinion. So be strong and have conviction in your opinion. Circle back to the lead. Go back to your 50 words. And, you know, in those 50 words, you would have encap encapsulated what it is you wanted to say. It might be a call to action. It might be some sort of epiphany that you want people to know, to, 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 to stumble on. And at the end, this is something I learned at the Pointe Institute many years ago, the Colombo moment. Colombo moment, for those of you who are old enough to know who Colombo was, <laughs> and I'm sure people to the right of me have no idea, Colombo was this bumbling detective in a detective series. And he had this one thing, and everybody waited for it in the show, was he would interrogate the, um, the suspect, and he'd ask all the most innocuous questions, but just as he was walking out the door, he would turn and ask the most point poignant question when everybody's guard, when the person's guard was down. And it would be a little throwaway, but it, in it was, in fact, the way with the thing that really got everybody. Think about what your Columbo moment is in your op-ed. Op right at the end, that's the most you would have taken them through your arguments, you would have taken them through your counter arguments, and you would have thrown in your anecdotes, etc. But right at the end, what is that one thing that's going to leave them going, oh, wow. Um, and that I use the, the, yeah, the idea of a Columbo moment. Um, any questions on that? Or should I just finish? I'll just go through the brief Thank template. Yeah, let's go through. 
So brief template, this is what you would, might or might not get from a Maxwell or a person who's going to be asking you to, to, to submit your op-ed. Deadline, guys, it is not a suggestion. <laughs> it is a hard stop, okay? The people you're dealing with, this is there's not a there's not a lot of review involved here. There's not going to be twenty of your peers going, okay, guys, I, I like that idea, but no, no, this is an op-ed. You've got to get it in, and it's got to get in when when the deadline is suggested. Um, word count seven to eight hundred uh, words is a is a solid. It's it's long enough that people will 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 engage with it, but it's also short enough that you don't end up waffling. Um, audience a lot of the time will be publication specific. You just need to think, position that person in your in your head, age, profession, gender, those kinds of things. Tone. The reason I put this in is very specifically most publications follow this. UK English AP style. You can you can go online and find these the definitions of these. Please use active voice. One, it cuts down the amount of words you use. Uh, and you know, I know, for instance, a lot of academics will use three four three syllable words in a line. Okay, and that just people just stumble over those active voice, shortened words, conversational but not casual. The title should. Genuinely try to be a question in the digital world where in the old days when you had a print publication, it used to be this kind of shouting headline. We try to, to create a sense of what is the question that you are answering in this. So try and throw out a couple of questions um, in terms of 60 characters, guys. Try and keep it to that. There will The brief will ask, will uh, position it, give you the angle, or you might be discuss the angle with the commissioning editor, um, and that will just require a brief description of the topic, some of the themes, and some of the arguments. And then the author bio is really important in op -eds. First, preferred title, whether you're a doctor, a professor, or a CEO, or depending on who it is you are, put your best foot forward, because that's going to lend its credibility to, to the piece. And then obviously the bi biography, no more than 450 characters. I know we all have 60 million things. Maxwell spoke about me in like 300 words. Um, but when we're talking about an op-ed, um, what's your field? What are the organizations? Maybe a couple of links and just a couple of the things that you've achieved or that makes you an expert in your field. And um, just in terms of your checklist, once you've written the op-ed, try and go through this. Check the clarity. Check, make sure that it's coherent and unified in its, because you know, as as if you, especially if you're trying to refer back to an academic paper, it can become a little fractured when you're trying to, you know, you spend so much time and energy on the methodology, and it means absolutely nothing in this op-ed. So suddenly it feels a little just, you know, um, uh, like I say, fractured. Simplicity. Is it simple? Have you taken out all those three syllable words that follow in one sentence? Direct quotations and paraphrasing for accuracy. Check those for accuracy. Um, the last thing you want is to paraphrase something from a paper or from a from an author, etc. And it completely changes the meaning and is completely inaccurate. Um, these are some of the journalistic things because um, when the fact checkers get in, um, say at the Daily Maverick, they're going to go through it and cross check your facts. And if you've you've misrepresented a, a quotation or a paraphrasing, it's going to be a problem, and you might never get your op-ed back out there. Um, properly credit all your sources. Again, this is now from a journalistic point of view. It's not really an academic one. We don't need to have formal citations, etc. You can follow AP style um, crediting of sources in weave them into your story. You know, it, nobody's gonna sit, go all the way down to the bottom and look at a, at a bibliography. And then just check your consistency of your opinion throughout the op-ed. Um, you know, use, use the template that we, we gave you early on in terms of those questions that you ask yourself right at the beginning. And that will then provide you 
a really solid way. I've not said, I've not given you a paint by numbers because I expect that, you know, the level of intellect <laughs> in the room is strong enough that you're going to be able to be able to bring in these elements in ways that, that will, will service um, or serve your intended use. Um, for the for the opinion and the paper or the research that you're going to be preferring, but try and keep these elements alive in your op-ed. And yeah, that's that's the uh, that's my little I wouldn't call it a masterclass, but uh, just a little bit of uh, insight into how to write an op-ed. Um, particularly for the two publications that we represent in this room, which would be the Daily Maverick and the Mail and Guardian. Any questions? <laughs> All right, thanks, thanks, Al, for that uh, informative um, presentation. Um, colleagues online, any questions? Colleagues in the room, any questions regarding what we've had? I do have a couple myself, but <laughs> I just want to give people a chance. Are you good? Okay. I think perhaps what you can do, maybe just take us through what then happens. I've submitted my piece. What is the editing? Okay, so the process, okay, so the process, well, obviously in, in relation to us, because we represent our own website and the two, the piece will then be we will look at it in relation to the kind of piece, not with the election series, obviously election series is very specifically for the Mail and Guardian, but any of your other op-eds that are gonna be coming through, um, it will go through our own internal editorial process. I'm the editor of Digital African, so I will read it for as a, as a content editor, look at it, make sure it, it, it meets some of those standards that I mentioned to you. Um, and then it will go through a second quality assurance process. But before then, I will come back with notes, et cetera, as I would in a newsroom where I'd go back to the journalist and say, um, didn't like that, that wasn't clear enough, et cetera. I'll come back to you with with with, with comments. We'll do that once um, because we're going to be up against the deadline. Um, so, and that will come back. So the authors will have at least one opportunity to uh, engage with the feedback. And then it will go off to the publication. So if it's Mail and Guardian, they'll go through their editorial process. Goes to the Daily Maverick, they'll go through theirs. Um, what they'll do is they'll kind of panel beat it into their own um, into their own structures. So for instance, the piece that I was sent off to the Daily Maverick, which was on the space innovation ecosystem. Um, we had very specific headers, that subheaders that we wanted to go through. It wasn't a, it, it, it yeah, it was an op-ed, um, and they kind of stripped out most of our headers. They put in their own headlines. Um, they changed the tone a bit to suit their particular readership. So, in terms of submitting for us for Digital African, you're likely to go through. Uh, two quality assurance processes. The first one will be one that comes back to the author. The second will be just literally based on the um, publication themselves. And they will they will run that through. If they have major issues, they may throw it back to us and say, listen, can we can we deal with this? Can we deal with that? But so far, um, we haven't had any issues. So um, but that's that's the process, yes. Um, turnaround time, we really would like, I know academics are not, this is not your, 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 um, your primary output. So probably two to three days would be a, a good turnaround time on the first edit. So we'll send it back with notes and then we'll give you like two to three days to get that back to us. Is that fair? Any questions on that? Um, there's actually questions online. Ah, there we go. Okay, I think I just responded to the turnaround time. Uh, okay, so yeah. the first, yeah, the first one, turnaround time. From the time that you submit it, we will have about a two-day turnaround time in terms of me doing the initial edit, sending back, give you another. So that's about five days um, to get it before I'm ready to send it off to subbing. Subbing will send it off to um, to the to the publication, and then 
that's usually quite quick, um, depending on whether or not they're happy with what we've submitted. Um, and you'll probably be published within a week or, well, call it sort of 10 days from first submission is to, to getting onto the, um, onto the publication. Um, with us, you'll get onto our website long before you'll get onto, onto the Daily Maverick or the Mail and Guardian, um, because we have full control of that. Um, would you be uh, allowed to submit a piece to more than one outlet for publication? Um, there's nothing stopping you. Um, from our side, we just offer you a much smoother route. Um, if you've got a, we've got contractual relationships with the two publications, but by all means. Um, Can I just come in here? Yes. Advisable. So send it to the first publication and then let them say yes or no. And um, because you're going to get really irritated editors if you submit twice and then that in times are like, and then you have to start that in So I'm sorry, I'm going to go to So, no. From my perspective, it's I don't want to to prescribe to the authors what they can and can't do with their with their stuff. It's not advisable, yes, to send it out. There's nothing stopping you, but you will likely, as Kamantha says, you will likely irritate the editors if you're trying to um, spam. It they do consider it spamming. It's it's kind of like PR where you will send out a press release and uh, the editors will either try to derive something from it. Um, in our case, the other thing is that if you do send it out and there is something there, there, will, there is always the risk that they will get their own journalist to go <laughs> write a story based on what you've just submitted. Um, with us, you will definitely get your op-ed out there. And then I just want to add something there, colleagues. Um, just also considering what the conversation said um, with regard to what they take. Um, I think they are much more focused on research that you've published where you can prove to them that we are next to that field. So I think if you were then to take some of that material, submit to the conversation, then use that material for a digital applicant, but rewrite in a different format. I think that should be fine because it still doesn't take away from the essence of your findings, things that you're trying to communicate. It's just the style. Um, I also think in 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 what I find with the papers that we've got all, you know, in our, in our repository from Tyresha, for instance, every piece has multiple angles in them. So it's probably not a bad idea. As I mentioned earlier, be pointed in the issue. So if you do want to be published across multiple publications, submit different stories. Um, you know, if you this is why I made the distinction between an essay and an op-ed. An essay would be kind of a summary of your findings, and that's not going to fly um, when you want to, to take it out to the public. Uh, find the angle. Find the thing that really hits home. Uh, and then craft your, your op-ed around that. It's really, really important. Um, you'll get a lot more traction across a lot more publications that way than trying to farm one piece out to multiple people. Um, and especially if it's trying to be a catch-all, that's not going to work. You've got many, 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 many opportunities to derive quite a lot of content out of that paper. Use it. Um, and the relationship that happens right now between Digital African and Tyresha gives you an opportunity to, to submit multiple versions, uh, or not multiple, but multiple stories or multiple op-eds derived from those, from those papers. Um, are all pieces commissioned? Absolutely not. Some will be, yes. The editors have asked us that question. Can they come to us and ask us for, for stories? And I have said yes, but that will be entirely dependent on whether or not the, the research is available or the authors are available to write those stories. Um, because of right now, it's very much a push situation where the relationship we have with the two publications is that they trust us on this very specific vertical, which is digitalization in Africa. 
they are not focusing on that, so they are depending on us to push through the content. Um, but should we spark something in their newsrooms, they may very well come back to us and say, listen, that op-ed that you sent us or that was published, we saw something on this and we'd, we'd like, you know, they may come back to the author for, for, for quotes. They might come back to ask for the paper itself. So it may spark a lot more, but uh, we would we would accept unsolicited pieces, absolutely. Uh, I've been burning to write on elections from the cyber law perspective, was planning for Daily Maverick. Um, yeah, I mean, we have the series, we have uh, access to Daily Maverick. Um, they're excited about us pushing beyond the five op-eds. So I would suggest talk, talk to Maxwell about this because Maxwell's our, our points person here. Do you, is that fair? No, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think more importantly, also where to send. Oh, what did I miss that? Oh, sorry, where to send. I think for now, um, the discussion we had with Prof Geshe was that only any new stuff that's beyond the election series, I think, should come through you um, in terms of. Um, Anything that's not related to elections and maybe for Maxwell? So, yeah, um, my colleague is putting up my email there. Yes. In terms of um, suggestions and um, ideas that you might have. And then once we receive this, then we will then respond to each of your emails. Um, I think a lot of the information, because we also need to share some of the guidelines. I mean, um, I came up with a document that works as a guideline that will sort of help you as you're trying to prepare your story idea. Um, yes. We just need to find a way. I think it's something maybe that we can share with the initial emails that we receive um, from people um, interested in writing for us. Yeah, I, I think because of the, the nature of the relationship between us and Tyresha, um, we have our points person. We don't, we'd rather not deal with individual authors. <laughs> so, uh, but if there's something burning, as you say, and if it might not fit in with what's happening with, within Tyresha, then by all means, put my email on. It's earl at digitalafrican.com. Um, please, by all means, there's no, no reason why you can't just send it directly to me as well. Um, but my suggestion is that come via Maxwell and um, uh, yeah, he's our points, points person in terms of Tyresha and the relationship. Yeah. So colleagues, it's not just professors, doctors, and others. We also take um, contributions from <laughs> you know, other researchers, postgraduate students. Uh, yes, absolutely. And maybe just to provide some context as to why this relationship is so important. Newsrooms around the world have become what they call juniorized, which means that a lot of the research and skills that used to be funded by advertising and distribution, et cetera, have been lost. So these kinds of content partnerships are really important because it means that we've disaggregated the cost of research to experts and institutions that do that. So we'd rather be able to say, this is research by this credible institution and this person represents this institution rather than a journalist going out and because the cost of that journalist is really expensive. And currently, the media landscape is not the most well-funded landscape. It is, we've lost a lot of mainstream media or independent media have lost a lot of revenue to Google and TikTok. And, <laughs> um, and that is also lay the platform for misinformation, disinformation, and just unsafe content. So for us to be able to continue to do this We've had to, like I said, disaggregate the cost of research uh, across multiple institutions and content partners. So on that point of generalization of newsroom, I was doing a neat analysis of what journalists need to be trained for the selection. These are some of the, the things that editors actually sent me. Uh, can Jacob Zuma become president again? What's the difference between traversion? Prevention of national elections, explain the National Assembly and COP prevention legislation, what are the powers of the different houses of parliament and the provincial legislation? 
legislation. What does the constitution say about general election? What happens when no party wins more than 51% of the vote? So the amount of work that needs to be done with them cover, I mean, it's actually terrifying. Yeah. And, and yeah, and, and I think that's one of the reasons we conceptualize the digital African around content partnerships, yeah. because yeah, to, 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 to get journalists, in the old days, you had beats, right? You know, there was the, you know, there was the business beat, the politics beat, and these people were kind of 35 years into this, and they knew everybody, and they, they had a solid foundation into understanding the processes and understanding the, the, the fields that they were working in. Today, unfortunately, we can't afford those people. Um, those, and they have, a lot of them have been absorbed into political parties, into corporate with jobs, because to... To be, to be able to afford the lifestyles that they had built up over the last sort of 30 years or 25 years, um, the media houses unfortunately cannot afford to pay them unless they're well-funded um, organizations, you know, um, by, by global institutions. Um, and yeah, like a, a Daily Maverick, for instance, has, uh, and the Mail and Guardian, the new, the new model to, to, to make up the balance of, of, of revenue that you lost to advertising has been to to kind of uh, convert the the newsroom into a not for profit so that you could attract donor in, uh, money and that the production of the actual content becomes the business side of things and so that becomes the new model and um, to be able to finance that is is quite a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I see they got you to do TikTok dance challenges. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Adi. Oh, yes, well, thank you, guys. Um, yeah, please. Any further questions? Any more questions? Okay, I suppose um, we'll wrap it up now. Um, Zilu, when is our next? Oh, the next lunchbox series on the fourth. Um, we were already lined up um as for then, but from this conversation some ideas just popped up. So <laughs> we have to talk about that offline <laughs> because the idea is to also then keep the lunchbox series sort of thematic. So yeah, then yeah. up to yeah. elections we would want so maybe do a whole TikTok dance or not. <laughs> Yeah, we can get these guys to dance. Yeah. <laughs> We're doing a session on because there's so much information that's being disseminated by that platform. Yeah. And it will be worth doing it. Is it it's, it's the leading platform, platform right? No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think the problem is a lot of the time people see TikTok as the voice of the youth. So when you go onto TikTok, it's as if it represents all of our opinions, but that isn't true, right? but there isn't representation of anyone's opinion, really. It's one person who says something and then they just happen to go viral and represent the rest of us, but that isn't true. Yeah. So with this, I think you're creating not only a framework on how to disseminate actual data-informed information, you're creating, a, um, I would say, a, pi a pipeline, a system, a value chain almost of credible information that can be sent out to the general public. And I think that is very important. It's extreme coming from a research background myself. The work that researchers do is invaluable, but you know, it stops and stays in specific rooms and it's almost, you know, disconnected from what we're doing. Even now the pipeline of, you know, going back to research, revisiting research topics, I think that's gonna start happening so much quicker and that return time is gonna be so much greater because now we can say, look, this is what people's reactions are. What is this saying to the information that we've already collected, you know, on people? So these kinds of lunchbox series, things like that, where we're engaging with people about the work that we're researching about is so important. So, yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very exciting. I mean, I'm not a TikTok, but I'm excited myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? um, thank you, colleagues, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to... Um, receiving those contributions um, as soon as possible. Um, different topics. Um, yes, there is um, a focus right now on what's happening in terms of elections, but we open to other topics as well because the platforms, it's not just one platform. I think maybe one thing that you just need to clarify yes. is how do you then determine 
where an article goes? Is it uh, daily memory or then uh, mailing guidance? Well, I think some of the times it'll be tone, it'll be in terms of the, what I'm finding is in t thematically, we're finding that, you know, when, when you start talking about things like misinformation, disinformation, you're looking very much around Daily Maverick because that's kind of, you know, they, they have a much broader appeal. But when we start talking about legislative things, regulatory issues, procedural stuff, you're looking more at the Mail and Guardian because they're targeting very much the policymakers, et cetera. Um, uh, so that's a different kind of discourse. So those, but those are, everything's taken on a, on a case by case basis. We'll look at it and go. And then of course, I'll have a conversation with either Scott or Branco and say, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And we'll, we'll, we'll make a decision based on that. And then obviously as we expand, um, we're going to be running these podcast series. Um, we'll be inviting the authors in to come and discuss their pieces. Um, and as I said, it will be more conversational as opposed to kind of a, a structured op-ed and those kinds is of things. Is it simultaneous to the publication or is it a few days after what, what happens? Um, as, as of that's the issue. So what we'll do is we'll, it, it doesn't have to be timed that way because we know about the issues I mean, Shen Kabi is the one who has to, to make that happen. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to see how that's going to play out because we are aware, I mean, having tried to run stories before, it becomes quite, quite complicated when we're trying to get particularly academic writers. But um, the nice thing is that it doesn't always have to be in studio. We'd love it to be in studio because it just has a completely different feel about it, but we can bring people in um, online as well. So just one other thing I want to mention. So obviously we have a lot of experts sitting at WSG and I will always advocate for them to be on all of these things. But I mean, in terms of resources, the university has a lot. You've got a whole department of politics, a whole humanities faculty, and there's so many people that could contribute to this in very, like maybe from an IR point of view or any other perspective. No, absolutely. I mean, we see this as a, obviously a 